Here's to the finest crew in Starfleet. Engage. Watch your back, son. I'm Luke. I'm Captain Captain Janeway of the USS Voyager. Captain Captain Janeway of the USS Voyager. Welcome to The Greatest Generation. It's a Star Trek podcast by a couple of guys who are just a little bit embarrassed about having a Star Trek podcast. I'm Ben Harrison. I'm Adam Pranica. How you doing today, Adam? Feeling good. Feeling warm. I was out in the sun a little bit today, having my Ooh. lunch. <laughs> I like a can of tinned fish sitting outside. That's my lunch lately. Yeah, hot girls eat tinned fish, you know. What? Who says that? Hot girls eat tinned fish. <laughs> Everybody says that, Adam. Hot girls eat tinned fish. Baby, baby, kiss me all over after eating tinned fish. <laughs> what kind of tinned fish did you have? You know what I like doing with my tinned fish is I share it with my beloved puppy, Ripley. I'll crack open a tin and I'll pour out some of the oil under her food, mix it all up. Oh, she oh, loves yeah. that. Oil up that food. That's good for the coat. Keeps the coat shiny. Uh, keeps yeah. my coat shiny. It's great. I got a variety pack, so uh, today I got some smoked salmon in the tin. All it's right. real nice. Hell yeah. <laughs> when we got Darwin as a puppy, I don't know if this happened or happens to you as a, as a puppy owner, but people would come up and give us dog advice all the time when, when he was a puppy. And especially in the early days, they seemed to be like <laughs> people who almost took pride in being like ethnic stereotypes so like a russian guy came up to us and was like give him potato put potato in food and we're like really <laughs> and then an italian guy with like a like a super mario the video game italian accent was like make sure you give him some olive oil it's good for the coat and we're just like do people do this <laughs> is this the, real the russian's like as puppy have sovereign border, you take <laughs> you take corner of pop up tent. You take for yourself. <laughs> Is belong to you. <laughs> Eighty-eight or ninety percent of people vote for puppy to eat potato. <laughs> I mean, was there something about your behavior that seemed to project a need? For a little bit of advice. Yeah, we probably look a little, you know, starry-eyed and unsure of, of what to do. Just imagine giving anyone unsolicited advice. What what must that be like? <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah, yeah. I think that, like, the word is out about un unsolicited advice to parents. Still not for pregnant women. Like, I mm. feel like when my wife was pregnant, tons of unsolicited advice, but I was worried about hearing a lot of it as a new parent. And I feel like people are like a little bit relaxed on that uh, I was relative challenged. to what I was worried about. <laughs> my wife and I were challenged recently in our resolve in that specific area. I mean, uh, besides the company that my wife and I occasionally have over. We we are and will remain childless. But still there are moments we feel moved to give advice. Like why would we ever give that <laughs> advice? We don't know shit. But in the in this one specific way, I think you'll understand. Some very dear friends of ours recently told us that they were about to give their youngest daughter a Apple Watch. Like mm. a like a hand-me-down watch because she is going to school and is wanting some sort of way to communicate with her parents because she's a little bit of a, a nervous bus rider. She's really young and she's nervous to be on the bus and she just wants a way to, to keep in contact with her folks. Except mm -hmm. they gave her this watch before her older brother had received a similar gift. Her older brother, <laughs> several years older, <laughs> without a watch or a phone or anything. like, <laughs> And... You can see me and my wife like wanting to ask the question, but why? Why would you <laughs> why would you intentionally start a fight between your kids this way? <laughs> this is an, this is a terrible idea. And me and my wife are like biting our tongues hearing this this plan that they have. We can't say shit. We don't have kids. Yeah. We can't give any advice. So what's happening now is we're receiving watch phone calls from an 8-year-old 
me and my wife are. <laughs> and they are absolutely unhinged. They are the best part of my day. When I'm around and able to pick up the phone and I'm hearing from this little girl telling me what it's like to be on the school bus, like, hell yeah. <laughs> that is crazy. <laughs> oh man your friends really woke up and chose violence when yeah. they made that decision <laughs> yeah uh. the consequences are explosive just all around us they're on me and my yeah. wife they're on them they're on the older brother amazing i mean it's it's almost an anthropological question what would happen if you gave a primitive or <laughs> young person access to a technology that they might not fully understand. I did not intend to create just the perfect pivot with that <laughs> with that story into the show, but it really does work. Also, I want to reserve the right to call kids primitive people. <laughs> yeah, you can call Daron primitive. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great verbal technology that I'm going to experiment with myself and I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> Daron's very pre-warp, isn't he? He's definitely pre-warp. It's season seven, episode twenty-two. Natural. Girl. Reverse course. Unless you've got something a little bigger in your torpedo tubes, I'm not turning you around. <laughs> the Brad is back. Yeah. The Brad is back. Just tell him it saves you money, Buster. And it is doing the thing that destroys most shuttles. Heading to a conference. When you dial in the CarPlay map or whatever, and your your destination is a dangerous place, I feel like a warning should come up. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it gives in you like the the destination is closing. Yeah, pretty close to when you get you all know. kinds of warnings in in those instances. But in Star Trek, when you're headed to a conference, a warning should pop up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it should be like, on a scale of Kittimer, how <laughs> fucked up is this going to be? <laughs> Are you feeling like a massacre today? <laughs> Either as a witness or a participant? I like Chakotay's energy basically throughout the episode. He's like, scenic route Chakotay. That's what I am. We don't have to be yeah. here in a hurry. Let's zoom across some treetops because I've got to believe... If you're in a spaceship mall floating through space where you're looking out the window and seeing the same shit every day, like being in a shuttle and just sort of like being a bird on the treetops has got to feel amazing. It really does. Yeah. And they are really soaking in the view. I mean, Seven is not quite as enthused about this. A sensor analysis would have provided the necessary information. But they're soaking in the views and they get a banger and... We learned that there's an energy field that was not initially picked up on sensors, and this situation goes from bad to worse really quickly. It like knocks out impulse, knocks out warp. They can't even wrap their minds around how it might have done this. And what they wind up doing is punching a hole through the field using the phasers on the front of their brat, and then it's like an emergency transport into a Sears garden center as the shuttle breaks up in the atmosphere and pieces of it fall all over the place. This episode really doesn't want you to hear the part where they couldn't transport out a moment before they do. <laughs> that was confusing to me. And also, the sequence is like this. Exterior of shuttle exploding into a thousand pieces down to the surface of the planet where they beam Chakotay and Seven are now standing up, and Chakotay is wearing a shoulder-slung pelican case. Yeah. Did he pack? Where did he get this thing? So we've seen kind of both things in Star Trek, right? Like the transport where, I feel like in the one of the J.J. Abrams movies, maybe there's one where there's like people falling off of a cliff or something, and they get transported, and they like belly flop on the transporter pad, right? <laughs> And there's a Beastie Boy song playing. Right. But also sometimes we see transports where somebody is transporting from a seated position and they materialize standing. And now we have an example of somebody who has transported from a seated position where he didn't have a hexagonal pelican case under his arm to one where he's standing and does. And this implies that the transporter can change the position that your body is in and give you accessories as part of... <laughs> 
what it does. I love the idea of this, and I want so much more. It's so fucking rad that it makes me mad that we have now three series of 90s era Star Trek in which they didn't take advantage of this. Every single time, they should go to the transporter room with none of the shit that they use on their away mission. No tricorder, no phaser, no pelican case. No guard tower. No electronic frontier. No nothing. And they beam down and they've got all the stuff. That's what it should be. What's nice about this concept is that it removes the idea of a continuity error, right? Like, right. how do you want to stand on the transporter? Stand however you want. Who gives a shit? Like, you're going to be wearing different stuff as soon as you materialize to wherever you're going. What difference does it make? It's also just cooler because, like, I don't want to think that there's, like, a place that they have to go to get stuff on a star tr ship. Like, there's no drawers on the bridge. There's no cabinets full of equipment. Why would you need that when the transporter can just provide it to you? And yet, like, one of the most enduring memories of watching TNG for the first time was, like, the idea of the weapons room in that... Right. uh one one zero zero one zero zero one episode like you'll only see the sign on the door i want to see inside those rooms i'm just getting a, a note from windy and slack that you nailed the sequence of ones and zeros on that perfectly <sighs> you remembered it flawlessly thank god i don't understand how he got the pelican case and battle damage like he's <laughs> He's got like a, a fracture and a cut on his leg that's bone so he got the injury like on the shuttle it seems that way. I mean, maybe the transporter didn't transport a bunch of stuff onto his body. Uh, maybe he was running around on the shuttle as it was exploding, gathering his maybe gear. So. That's got to hurt hitting your shin on the transmission tunnel or something. That sucks. There is a moment in this scene where I really thought Chakotay was winding up to just lay it on Seven, just like hit on her like the moment that they get there because he says, well, if we have to be stranded somewhere. And I was like, oh man, is he going to say, I'm glad I'm stranded with you? Holy shit. And then he goes, we we transported somewhere really nice looking. <laughs> and he's like, oh, <laughs> you didn't. How quickly and how long were you thinking of the amount of time Chicote would be made to keep carrying the case while injured before Seven finally <laughs> grabbed it from him? <laughs> I was like, what is this fucking, like, I don't know if it's, is it feminist to not grab the bag from Chakotay? Is it chivalrous of him to keep it? I don't know what this is, but when you got an injured person, you got to grab their bag. Right, because it's not just a cut. He has a fracture and he's like walking around with this thing. God, Seven's cold here. <laughs> it takes many scenes before she grabs that bag from him. So meanwhile, we go up to space. The final frontier. And it's like a super space station over a planet. And there's tons of traffic. And the Delta Flyer is zipping around, going over and under things. And Paris gets radioed up at the controls of the Delta Flyer by, I guess, like a traffic cop from Lidocian security or something who has observed the Delta Flyer going faster than the speed you're supposed to go in port or something like that. You don't need to be an expert on Ladosian law to recognize with that exterior shot that there is a very clear like order of traffic happening that yeah, and, Paris, and Paris is totally ignoring it. Yeah. <laughs> Am I making any sense here? So he's in trouble and he's basically told like you will it will be told to you by your superior officer what you're punishment is going to be. And that punishment, it turns out, is going to be traffic school. What does she do? Table! What did you think of how amused Janeway was in this scene to be telling Paris that he broke the law and he would have to endure the punishment of the local laws? Like, <laughs> I like the idea that the captain has the choice here because, yeah. <laughs> like, when Wesley trampled the, the plants... In TNG, like, I think there was a part of Picard that was like, I will appreciate you sentenced to death. <laughs> <laughs> Picard was doing the math there and he was like, on the one hand, the boy is a giant pain in my ass. But on the other hand, his mother will be far worse if <laughs> I allow him to be stabbed with this needle. I wonder if I could broker a kind of compromise where Wesley would be forced to 
watch a puppet be strangled by Larry David. (laughs) (laughs) That's punishment enough. (laughs) He seems very sensitive to the idea of puppet strangulation. What you don't realize is that all he can think of is the hand within that puppet <laughs> and the harm that may be befalling that hand. He went on and on about how beloved the puppet was without recognizing how beloved Larry David is. <laughs> Larry <laughs> David. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if if Ro Lerlin and Larry David got married, she would be named Larry Lerlin. <laughs> Because, of course, she would take his first name in place of her last name rather than his last name in place of her last name. Oh, indeed, yes. (laughs) Oh, yes. (laughs) (laughs) So, Seven and Chakotay are trudging through the Sears Garden Center and they find a little bit of junk from the shuttle. Like the the debris field is a pretty wide area that they're searching. Uh, and this first thing that they find does not turn out to be useful. Which is good, right? Like the assumption that every piece of scrap metal that falls off a shuttle could be used to make a beacon. A little yeah. far-fetched, right? <laughs> I mean, if you can make like a personal shield out of your uh, communicator like Worf did in that one episode, I feel like maybe that is something about Federation technology. It's just got so much shit in it that you can do almost anything with any piece. It's crazy that any combination of com badge and tricorder couldn't be made to do a beacon. Like that that's <laughs> insufficient somehow. Our course is locked in. What? Listen to me very carefully because I'm only going to say this once. They also pick up some humanoid life signs. What's more surprising, that they found humanoid life signs or that Seven finally takes the pelican case from Chicote? <laughs> he has walked miles on a broken leg. <laughs> oh, okay. This might be a good place to stop. I'll get that case from you, buddy. Let me lighten your load. Sounds great. <laughs> Uh, she takes it, puts it on her shoulder, and then provides another shoulder for Chicote to lean on as they go look up over a bluff and find, like, in loincloth style hunter gatherer outfits, some aliens that have very similar loaf to Ladosians, but they tell us based on their scans are not Ladosians. In a Skyrim parlance, it really looks like you could walk up to any of these folks and hit triangle to start a conversation or whatever. Like, right. especially in the wide shot from up, up above in the bluff, like the effect has a hard time hanging together. Th- these are digital <laughs> folks in this yeah, shot. Yeah, yeah. It's weird that they're like superimposed into an environment or something. Like, I wasn't quite sure why they would need to do this. I wonder if they needed coverage and didn't get it. Like, if they did this after the fact. Maybe. So Chicote is like, well, this is really neat. I love, like, the anthropological uh, potential of this crash landing that we've done. Because as Uh, you remember, I'm an archaeologist, and and I have Miriam interests in this area. They look pre-warp. So they're babies? Is that what you're saying? Like, they're little kids? (laughs) Yeah. 18 months or so. Sure. Uh, One thing I kept wondering was, does this giant bag that Chakotay has been carrying have a medical kit in it? And it does not seem to. It seems like it's empty. This case is empty. (laughs) The reveal later is that it is fucking empty. So, So either the computer in transporting them down mid crash or Chakotay by getting up and going and grabbing it before the emergency beam out. Somehow, the selection for what they might take on their crash landing adventure was empty giant bag. One of our more interesting missions. I like the idea that this might be an example of like future people are just like us in that, <laughs> like, I know there's going to be a moment where we've got to go into our emergency bags. Like, we're going to have an earthquake or some shit in LA. We're going to have to go in there. And where are all the granola bars? <laughs> are you saying we ate them? <laughs> because we were just hungry? 
<laughs> That's what I feel like is happening here. Like this emergency kit was already ransacked. Right. Yeah. Seven goes off to look for tech and quickly finds something and radios back to Chakotay, who is like passing out from the pain. A, sh- a shot that very much reminded me of the time the gang from the D beamed down to the planet where Anybody Canyon is. And we saw the like creepy Ferengi fingers going for the communicator badge. Yeah, that's we a good callback. Hand reaching from off camera to grab. Chakotay's communicator badge because the curious hunter-gatherer attached to that hand is hearing Seven's voice come out of it. Why can't you hit the little button on the side that that switches to silent? (laughs) Why couldn't Chakotay have done that? Instead, he's watching his comm badge get smashed. Yeah. Under a bare foot, right? Or was it- No, I think it- I think they got like a river stone or something. Okay. Um, yeah. But I was surprised at how just absolutely shattered it could be with, you know, like you would think that they would build it out of tougher stuff. You'd think. Yeah. That night, uh, Seven is spying on some native folks searching for Chakotay and she finds a bunch of them inside a Star Trek cave tending to Chakotay. And when she sees him, he's like, no, no, it's cool. They're friendly. You said we were supposed to avoid interaction. And they're fixing my leg, see? And and she looks down at his leg. A leg that is broken. Keep this in mind. And what's happening here is a couple of lengths of straw have been wrapped around it. And then maybe there's a little bit of goo on the wound. But the thing is, we've already been told that that leg wound is infected. So it's hard to know whether or not this goo is distinct from infection goo or right. something that they've done. Is it a leaf or is it gangrene is a question that leaps to mind. There is an awkwardness to this scene that I'm really hoping you picked up on, which is like, Chicote is like, hey, you know, we should stay. We don't have a cave and these folks are nice and it's already late. So why don't we just do that? And the energy here that Seven has that she doesn't verbalize is, well, no one invited me to stay. And there's nowhere for me to sleep. <laughs> like, it's easy for you to say, you yeah, already, you have, already a have a bed. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's also just, it's it's so awkward because he basically says, I'm going to get some sleep. I suggest you do the same and like lies down and closes his eyes. So she doesn't even get to present any alternatives. So she just goes and like sits near him and the locals start like trying to touch her face. Uh, yeah, it's tough. She doesn't want to stay here. But she can't do that thing that Janeway's boyfriend did at the bar a couple episodes ago. She can't just say, actually, we've got plans and we intended (laughs) to spend the night by ourselves. (laughs) They don't have that level of communication with these folks either. No. So uh, she sits there and flinches as the aliens try to touch her face. And we cut up to a Starship Voyager whose crew seems blissfully unaware of the situation. W slash R slash T, they're missing first officer and XB. Wouldn't you just have a standing yellow alert anytime someone was going to a conference? (laughs) Like, as soon as that shuttle leaves the shuttle bay, yellow alert. Yeah. Check in every 20 minutes. Not a big deal. It's yellow. It's fine. It's the same color as engineering and operations. Everyone likes them, right? Uh, Salt of the earth bunch. Come on. So Neelix, BLT, and Kim are getting ready to do some sightseeing because with the conference and Paris's traffic school, they have a few days here in the system. And Paris bumps into them in the hallway and uh, seems very confident that he's going to be able to get out of traffic school pretty quickly because... He's read the regs, and as long as you can pass the test, you don't actually have to take the class. So I will be seeing you in a couple of hours. You have to admire his optimism. But they go into the transporter room, and Mr. Clegg, the flying instructor, beams up and immediately kind of dumps a bucket of water on any idea that he might be, like, loosey-goosey with the rules. This driver's ed instructor... Has got such Mr. Hand vibes from Fast Times at Ridgemont High. (laughs) He is great. And he is a great foil for Paris. I think this is an amazing B-Dunks episode because he's got that perfect gear where he's resistant 
to the bullshit, but not an asshole about it. He doesn't participate in it in a way that's like resentful or shitty. Like for the entire episode, he just kind of plays the game because he has to play the game. But like, I'm always on his side in an interesting way. I think that's a great magic trick he's got. So how long will this uh, review take? Mm, Typically about four hours, but there's no rush. Disruptive class clown would be Mm -hmm. an easy gear for him to drop into in a way that would make us kind of turn on him. And instead he stays just on the other side of the line. Whatever side of class clown does not get a pop quiz after you say some bullshit to the teacher. (laughs) Like he walks right up to that line without like getting everyone punished for it. Right, exactly. Nobody has to drop and give Mr. Clegg 20. Yeah. But his friends do take this opportunity to kind of fuck with him because they get on the transporter pad and do plenty to expand Mr. Clegg's idea of his culpability for the crime that got him put into this place in the first place. Back on the surface of Ledos, Chakotay is trying to communicate with these loincloth folks and He starts with a stick and dirt situation to kind of establish a geographical vocabulary. Stuff like river and mountain is going to be important because those two things are nearby. And he's trying to get his position on the planet. He's trying to figure out where the hell they are. Where are we? And these folks, I'm almost positive, do not vocalize anything the entire episode. They are completely silent, right? Right. They have a form of sign language that Chakotay is trying to learn and is picking up on really quickly. But yeah, they none of them ever say anything. This guy he's talking to clearly doesn't fit in with the social or political hierarchy of the group because he trades for a Maquis pin and all of a sudden he's Maquis. Maquis? That's it. (laughs) That's all it takes. That's all it takes. Yeah. I guess we learn way later that these people are called the Ventu, but there's like a a girl that is very curious about the the process of Chakotay learning to communicate with this guy. And they figure out, you know, where they are on this kind of makeshift map that he's made. And then Seven shows up with the hunk of techno crap that she's found and a plan. She's like, hey, listen, like this thing, if we plug it into the deflector shield from the shuttle, could be the way we make a communication speak. And I picked that thing up on my tricorder and uh, it's a little ways off but I can go get it and they have a little bit of a debate about like whether or not to solicit or accept local help in trying to do this new mission especially because it's so difficult to communicate with them like Chicote goes on and on trying to figure out like what the sign for waterfall is and finally he just whips it out and pees into the mud and the guy's like oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> and he does this, the hand sign for waterfall. Yeah. Just rocketing piss into the dirt. Oh. <laughs> Just getting everywhere. Yeah. And then he's like, where's the logging camp nearby? And he takes a big shit in the dirt. And the guy's like, oh yeah, that's a little bit further, like four kilometers that way. There's also uh, a mountain range with just two enormous mountains that we need to cross. <laughs> Do we have anything that could look like that? Nearby seven. You don't see natural beauty like this every day. Are there, is there a, a bog anywhere with a very like scummy texture that, but it's quite small, like not, there's not that much of the bog. And he jacks off in the dirt. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was on pins and needles for what <laughs> that was going to be. <laughs> It is very clear that that the mission to set up a beacon is going to be Seven's alone. Chakotay is not healed up in such a way that would allow him to walk the great distances that she has to. Yeah, but also they're kind of at a bit of an impasse about how to observe the Prime Directive best, given the fact that the locals know about them. And, you know, like, the it's tricky. Like, Seven is like, I just want to, like have as little to do with them as possible. And Chakotay is like, well, I don't quite have that luxury, so I'm going to stay here, but maybe you could get one of them to help you. And she's like, no fucking way, man. So all of this transpires in front of the, I don't know, teen or early 20s 
lady that is there, and she seems very curious about it, but also unable to really parse what they're talking about. So Seven goes and gets her expedition launched in a pretty ignominious way. She is doing that thing I think we've all done where we're like walking and looking at our phone and uh, there's a little bit of uneven part of the path and she trips and eats shit and Mm -hmm. amazingly her tricorder goes into a crevasse in the dirt that is just deep enough that she can't reach in and and grab it out. I think this is hard to pull off. Like, it's hard to do a plausible fall that does exactly what you need it to do with an object. Yeah. I think Jerry Ryan does a good job here or the stunt person, but come on, pick up your fucking feet, Seven. Like, you cannot afford to fall down. No more broken (laughs) legs on this mission. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and also, like, it's just such obviously, like, potting soil that they built this part of the set out of that, like, it strains credulity that she couldn't get a stick and, like, dig the hole a little bit bigger and get the tricorder out. Yeah. Yeah. Like, she gives up on the tricorder way too easily. And, like, what they should have done is have it go off a cliff or something like that. Or, you know, have a, a local bird steal it or something. Yeah, I mean, how deep is this hole? And also, would you ever reach your arm into an alien (laughs) hole? (laughs) Like, the the thing about watching Star Trek is this moment feels so dangerous. (laughs) It feels like low-key more dangerous than crashing a shuttle. (laughs) It really does. It's amazing she still has an arm at the end of this one. Yeah, I really thought uh, she'd withdraw a stump, but... No. Now instead, she's just got to go without her tricorder. So we cut back to the village where uh, the dude that Chakotay has been communicating the most with has created a crutch for him, and they're walking around, and... Uh Uh-oh. Some of the locals are cultural appropriationists. That's not cool, guys. Don't put the tribal tats on your faces if you don't understand them, if they're not part of your culture. I mean... They do have a yearly music festival here. (laughs) And over the years, people have gotten away with that shit. I mean, it's still, like, not a good look, but, like, if you did it in the 90s before some of these conversations had really kind of penetrated the the broader consciousness, like, slightly less fucked up, maybe, but still, like, you shouldn't be doing it, okay? I'm sure everyone regrets doing this after the fact. (laughs) So we cut back to seven. It's now nighttime. And wouldn't you know it, she's tripping over the same crap in the woods, same spot. Mm -hmm. She uh, flashlights around to get her bearings. And we realize she has walked in circles. She is back near this crevasse that her tricorder went down. And uh, it's starting to get a little stormy. You know who's got great fallen samurai here is Jerry Ryan. Like once, once you take a couple tendrils out of the bun, fallen samurai all the way. She looks disheveled. She does look disheveled. And it's interesting that by the time the hair is all the way down, it like goes, It there's like disheveled intermediate. And then like, I am just like more at ease in this environment now hair, which is mm-hmm. just like, I am not trying to keep my hair up anymore. Right. Yeah. But yeah, this this is the this is the intermediate phase where it's really like wash day hair for me if I haven't had a chance to put product in. It's just like mm-hmm. all in my yeah. fucking face. <laughs> just want to shave it off. Uh-huh. God. <laughs> uh this uh this local lady shows up and wants to help her despite Seven's misgivings about receiving help. And she offers Seven a blanket, which is, I think, the first recorded instance in Star Trek history of a lady wearing burlap. I don't believe this. I love how her first instinct is to offer Seven a scratch cocktail, which is nice, (laughs) like a premium cocktail that comes with real juice and uses something weird like like smoky embers Uh, to, to flavor it. Pretty nice. Nice. Um, cool that she uh, that their way of starting a fire on this planet is a chemical reaction between a local mineral and the juice of a local fruit. Is this a thing? Can you start a fire with juice and rocks? Because that's amazing. Listen, if so, I got to put some of that in my emergency kit. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. Would the would the fruit keep in your emergency kit? 
Uh, definitely not. No. Yeah, like, I think having stuff in your emergency kit that if accidentally combined could cause a fire <laughs> yeah seems, seems risky <laughs> the actor who plays this little girl autumn reeser isn't that crazy well oh she was on the oc she sure wow. was yeah i looked her up and saw that she has like 2023 20, credits seems like a lot of wedding related tv movies maybe oh yeah she was on A lot of great television that I enjoyed, but I think pivoted into Hallmark movies lately. She was in Sully. Wow. Yeah. Can you believe it? Amazing. Yeah, she played the plane. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. She came a long way from uh, from this early Voyager role. Yeah, she rules. And this was was role number one, wasn't it? Wow. That's great. About that. Good for her. She's going to make sure that Seven's okay here in the forest overnight. Offer Seven some food, which Seven is too rude to accept. I'm not hungry. <laughs> you're insulting them and you're embarrassing me. Well, I've got to get that platinum. Get that roll, bit of lodgement. I've got to get that platinum. Are you planning a heist? Gold. I've got to get that platinum. Put your platinum where your mouth is. We cut up to Voyager and the shuttle bay where Mr. Paris and Mr. Clegg are in the cockpit of the Delta Flyer where Mr. Clegg is going over some of the design flaws of the ship and Paris thinks he's got an out here like the the de- design flaws of the ship cannot be blamed on the pilot of the ship but Mr. Clegg looked up the history of the Delta Flyer and knows that Paris designed it so everything is his fault <laughs> it's such a great social angle that Paris takes here when you're in a situation with a great power imbalance like this Paris is doing that a keto move where he's like absorbing the criticism and making it a reason that things are messed up. So to put them on the same side of the argument or the issue, he's like, Mr. Hand, I agree with you. Shit is fucked up. And I barely got this thing through space to begin with. I can't wait to make these corrections. Thanks to you. I I think I finally have enough of a reason to. Yeah. (laughs) I'm struggling to think of an example, but I feel like uh, a lot of like propaganda shows will will have like a person being taken into custody, trying to blame society for the thing that they're being arrested for. Right. Yeah. Uh, and like that's kind of what Paris is trying with the, the driving school instructor. But when you also created society, it is less of a valid excuse. I like this moment for B-Dunks. I've I've said it before and I'll say it again. He's really playing around with that line of of being too much here. Yeah, like I don't want to jump to the end here, but like good B-Dunks episode, good Chakotay episode, good Seven episode. Yeah. The thing that I kept thinking about all through this was like, we are so close to the end of this series. I cannot believe that they have not started an arc about something that will get us home. Yeah. Yet. It is just staggering to me that we are as close to the end as we are. They're like, this is just another episode. Like, <laughs> we're just still kind of like going home as fast as we can, but we're 40 years away still or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's still time for a classic Star Trek episode here, I guess. Yeah. So back on Ledos, it's morning. And uh, it turns out that the blanket that that girl gave Seven is covered in peanut M&Ms. I think you're gonna be okay here. They have a thin candy shell. Hmm. Surprised you didn't know that. It's the sort of thing like when you visit the M&M store, you're like, what am I gonna do with this? This is weird, but it makes a great <laughs> gift. It is a great gift, yeah. I went to New York. <laughs> <laughs> this is Seven's I went to Leto's blanket. <laughs> They share some, like, dried mango or something, and Seven reproduces Chakotay's stick-in-dirt map for this young woman, and... Just starts, like, she squats and just starts rocketing piss into the dirt, like... (laughs) There are so many rivers on this planet. And the girl is, like, looking at it, and she's, like, 
kind of, you know, tilting her head back and forth. She's like a little confused, like she can't quite orient herself. And Seven's like, oh, right. And then she takes a big shit in the corner <laughs> of the map. And the girl's like, oh, gotcha. Hey, Egypt, this is grossing <laughs> me out. They should stop. <laughs> they should stop talking about this. <laughs> You might find that ironic as a sentiment coming from me, given what I represent as a runner. This girl leads Seven to a giant three-headed waterfall, which I understand, given the the spray that Seven was able to make with her piss. Like <laughs> <laughs> the girl thought that's that's where she wanted to go, and that's where this they is are. what you were talking yeah. about, right? <laughs> <laughs> so she sits down for a while and and encourages Seven to do the same. And that's because the girl is a real scenic route type of person, the way Chicote was. A sensor analysis would have provided the necessary information. Yeah, and Seven's like, could we just find a, a road that cuts over and get on the five and yeah. get the fuck to the to the nose cone of the shuttle? Yeah. Speaking of great views, Chicote is still among the loincloth folks. And I guess we haven't done much to describe these people. Uh, they are your your standard issue, like loaf of the week type aliens, but all of them have like either runner or swimmers bodies. None of them are absolute units, but they're all like the sort of person you see at Equinox doing social media videos or whatever. Like, <laughs> like there's some good definition here. Yeah, they are working out for strength, not for bulk. Like they can like stand on their head on one hand, but they, you know, aren't huge or whatever. Very aspirational. It's really something. Chicote is trying to tell the main guy, the guy he's been talking to from the start, that Seven is late and he needs to find her. <laughs> and so <laughs> how this guy interprets this is Chicote needs a lady. You, us now. No, no, I can't live here. I, I've got a job and a girlfriend. Ha! Many brides here. That's very funny, but also the way Chicote chooses to get across the idea of Seven of Nine is to draw, like, a stick figure face in the circle. And dirt again. But like it's confusing because he's been drawing a circle with a river running through the middle of it as his this is a map of the region drawing in the dirt. So drawing another circle, very confusing. You know <laughs> just two eyes and a dolphin. <laughs> in a life or death situation, I think expediency is important. And I don't think, especially because none of the other crew people are around. I don't think it's an awful look for Chicote to hold both hands in front of his chest and go, seven of nine. <laughs> seven of nine. <laughs> Help me find her. <laughs> That's not reductive or insulting. He's trying to save her life, and she, he's trying to describe her to people that he doesn't have a common language with. Yeah. This guy interprets this as bring me a woman, and... A, a woman is grabbed and brought over, and she has strapped a little circuit board to her dolphin area. And this is even more dismaying to Chakotay. He's starting to worry that uh, a cargo cult is starting to form around his and Seven's interaction with the tribe. Did you think for a hot second that this might have been a Chakotay love interest? Never gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> Not on this show. No way. Too much story. They don't have time for him to go cut a branch out of a tree and then refine graphite and insert <laughs> that into the branch and then break <laughs> that pencil that he's manufactured from primitive but materials. But a hell of a montage that would be. <laughs> it would be good. Yeah, it turns out these people are also collecting shuttle pieces, and so he's really worried about this. They're doing that kind of thing like older folks do out of like weird glass they find on the beach. Like, I'm going to make earrings or whatever. This is my post-retirement hobby. Yeah, yeah. So he, he makes it very clear that he needs to find the one with the big boobs and they like <laughs> finally understand. So uh, we cut over to Seven who has found the nose cone of the shuttle and her guide, you know, wants to touch it and... 
Seven shoes her away. So the young woman goes off and uh, starts playing with some rocks she finds on the ground, which happen to be sticking to each other like magnets. There's enough miracles here to blow your brain. I love this. And I love how it's not center frame either. The contemporary version of this is like, if you touch a broken tank on the battlefield now, like all that shit is full of depleted uranium. Like it right. will fuck you up. So it yeah. kind of makes sense in a hundreds of years in the future kind of way. Like you would not want to touch a ripped open brat style shuttle. That would be bad. Finally, Voyager has found out that two of their key crew members are missing. And up in the ass lab, Tuvok and Kim report on this to Captain Janeway. And the way they found the location of the crash is that they found a fragment of the shuttle just sitting on top of this energy barrier. I love how it looks like a glitch in a video game. Yeah. It's so great. It's really good. I love this idea, too, that the energy barrier is, like, strong enough that something can just be sitting up there. (laughs) Yeah. But the problem is they can't get through the barrier to determine if Chakotay and Seven are still alive inside. Like, they can't get through it. Their sensors can't get through it. All they've got is what they see on the outside. So Janeway blows in a FaceTime call to the Ladogian commander. And this guy on screen doesn't think there are any survivors. I love how premature he's like, I'm sorry for your loss. (laughs) The barrier is very powerful. (laughs) And what he goes on to say is like, there's Ventu in there. And Ventu are past people. And by past people, I don't mean children and babies. I mean, like, our version of past people. And they got hidden behind this barrier by some aliens. And I wish I could put you in touch with these aliens, but they left hundreds of years ago. And we don't know how to get inside this thing. As far as I'm concerned, it's impossible to get in or out of this barrier. We'd love to be able to help. I I love the whole, like, everything that is implied by his quick summary of what happened is very interesting. It's Mm -hmm. like there's a novel of speculation about what might have gone down in this. And, you know, Janeway's like, oh, yeah, like, that kind of sounds like some type of shit that early humans might have gotten done to them had the situation been similar because we haven't always respected other people's land rights and what not. You could really see it, right? There's some people you don't understand. You might just want to round them up and stick them in camps until we figure out what to do with them. Right. So it seems like maybe some other aliens just took care of that whole yeah. situation <laughs> for them. Yeah. We don't see whoever those aliens were. And if we did, we would think they were bad. Yeah. But like, I mean, this also does like sort of mimic like there's a few uncontacted tribes still on earth like in Mm -hmm. our present day and like there's that island off of i think it's off of sri lanka where like the locals have killed like every single person that's ever tried to go there you know to do anything i think that's cool as hell stay away they don't want you there (laughs) so no indication whether the ladosians were in on this from the perspective of hundreds of years ago, like did this alien species go like, hey, you want us to like put something up so that those assholes can't come in here? Like may- maybe, it- maybe it went that way. I know you don't want to do it. Do it. Coffee black. Make it yourself. I'm trying to help you see this as an opportunity to grow. Make it yourself. So as challenging as it is at this point to go into the barrier, get anyone out of the barrier, They are able to get this piece of shuttle debris from on top of the barrier. It landed on the roof of this thing like a Frisbee at a neighbor's (laughs) house. So BLT and Tuvok are scanning this in engineering while Janeway watches. And they they start talking, like, could they use some sort of phaser frequency to get inside that shield? Maybe even the same frequency that the shuttle clearly used to get inside originally? The problem is, like, that the feedback that that phaser blast caused is the thing that got them inside the barrier to begin with. So, like, shooting a phaser from Voyager seems pretty dangerous in that same way. They don't want to end up the same way at the, that the shuttle did. Meanwhile, down on the planet, Seven starts up her gadget that she has magrubered together. I'm gonna shoot. I'm gonna fucking shoot. And it sort of, like, wharf lightnings and dies. And... When she notices that her little buddy has magnetic rocks next to her, she realizes like, oh, like this must be a magnetic field interference situation. And right as this is dawning on her, Chakotay comes around the corner and she's like, oh, great. You've got a a tricorder. This is 
exactly what I needed. Nice to see you too. I lost mine. She figures out there's like a place that isn't as magnetized a little bit off, but they'd have to carry the entire nose cone of the shuttle over there. And at this point, they're like, okay, fine. I guess we'll like solicit help from the locals and completely ignore the prime directive. It's a really conflict-filled moment because the nose cone is 500 kilograms and no one knows how much that weighs. (laughs) So like it would take 50 people to lift it up? (laughs) How much is that like relative to a Volkswagen? (laughs) Like a lot more? Five hundred kilograms. I I don't know. I I don't know. Can you tell me how much that is in stone? So if that's five hundred kilograms, I weigh one kilogram. Do I have that right? <laughs> how much would you say this is worth on the street if it's five hundred kilograms? Absent any other ideas, they're like, let's get the natives to carry this five hundred kilogram part through the dirt (laughs) and that's the plan and if you've forgotten that paris is still taking driver's ed this is a scene that reminds you paris is taking driver's ed with mr hand and he's driving the flyer through space cones that have been set up for him check your mirror signal Now pull into traffic. At this point, I was like, I cannot believe that this is still a storyline. This feels like so tacked on and so meaningless. (laughs) It's amazing. Who cares? B-Dunks does so much with so little here. He really does. I think it really rests on the shoulders of he and and Mr. Hand here to carry this. And they, they carry these scenes ably for as thin as they are. We do not get to see any of the montage of moving the nose cone, but we do get to see them arriving at the spot that they have selected to try to MacGruber this thing again. This is exactly like how the pyramids were built, right? You just see the finished product. You don't see how they move the stones. It's a mystery. It must have been aliens. (laughs) Yeah. A lot of sweaty loincloths after this transit. So in orbit, Voyager tries its phaser punch through the energy field thing and man it looks so violent when it shows the like interaction of the phaser and the energy field and it they get the feedback thing that they're worried about how great is it that you didn't get any warning about this like like they talk about it a couple scenes before but that we just cut back to voyager as it's firing i love this yeah it was cool and I was, I was scared for the people on the surface. I was like, oh, what's going to happen to them? I thought for sure we'd get a banger react from inside the dome. Nothing. Yeah, nothing. It's like imperceptible to them. And then Tuvok starts talking about, oh, maybe we can drop a torpedo on them. And I was like, oh, fuck. Like, this is going to be so bad. Yeah. Like that a lot. Got plenty of those. Yeah. Instead, before this torpedo plan can be put into place, the barrier drops because Seven's scheme of connecting all these broken parts to the deflector dish has worked. But uh, it also shocks her little buddy who walks over and touches the nose cone while the wharf lightning is flying. And so pretty rapidly, like the, sh- the field is down, they get on the radio with Seven, and, and she's like, beam up Chakotay, beam down a med kit. I got to help this lady. And the episode has changed totally. It's true. The thing that we thought was the last problem on the episode is solved, and in a way that was really interesting. The girl's going to be fine. She wakes up in a cave where Seven has remained to watch over her, and her curiosity almost killed her, and yet she remains curious about Seven's metallic hand, and... uh Now that she's going to be okay, Seven's like, all right, I got to go. And this girl loves to watch her leave and also wants to give her the M&M store blanket as a gift. Yeah. And and Seven's like, I think she is a little bit worried about it being like legal for women to own burlap in Sector 001, you know? Also- I don't know if it's a law, but it's definitely like not done. You know what I mean? kind of dark to see so much blanket trading occur among past people. Mm. Like, seems kind of dangerous and questionable. Right, yeah. I did notice the girl, like, coughing into the blanket before she gave it to Seven. Yeah. It's nice to see that going in the other direction for once, you know? I think it would be nice if it went in no direction, Ben. (laughs) 
<laughs> My position on the show, and I know this is just one of the hosts and not both, poison blankets are bad and they shouldn't <laughs> be given to people. So you're anti-biological warfare? I am, yeah. Huh. You heard it okay. here first. Wow. Why would you say something so controversial yet so brave? I, I, I don't know if I'm willing to die on such a spicy hill, but uh, Seven walks out and finds a bunch of Ladosians walking around scanning shit, and she meets Barris, who is leading an expedition that has apparently just like been scrambled to inside the area where this energy field was quick fast because the Lodosians are very excited about seeing what's in there and like what they can cultivate for resource extraction and shit. Covered retail area, great sadness for Utapu's people. Every year, more and more space devoted to non-garden products. And he's like, yeah, this is great. I mean, like the Ventu are going to love this because we're going to start, uh, you know, helping them and giving them all all kind of technology and stuff. And uh, Seven feels a little bit of a way about this, uh, which is discussed in the next scene in Janeway's office between her and Chakotay and the captain. Isn't it possible the Ladosians will improve the lives of the Ventu? Improve them? How? Chakotay is on Team Restore the Barrier, and it seems like for a moment, Seven is like, well, I mean, a strip mall might be good. You know, it's just sort of like <laughs> jumpstart capitalism in this place. See, father's land disappeared due to retail diversification. Yeah, those people had no money. Yeah. And it really is a shame to see people with no money. Think of how much better and more detailed my M&M store blanket would be with like the full weight of capitalism behind it. <laughs> they had some like industrial looms down there. I yeah. think that they'd be a lot happier. So on the bridge, Janeway tells the ambassador that, uh, look, it's customary for us to not interfere with the lives and cultures of past people, which is why we're going to restore that barrier the way we found it, campsite style. And this ambassador is mega bummed to have to evacuate uh, the mall surveyors and stuff that he's got in there. Yeah. Uh, and you think it it's going to go smoothly. But it's not. It's sort of broken to him, like, here's the news. Like, we are taking that nose cone, you know, we're transporting it up so that we're not leaving our tech lying around for primitives to hunt or gather up. And he's like, okay, well, I, uh, I guess I'll go let everyone know. And then, like, one of their Earth hours passes and they're getting ready to beam it up and banger, they get attacked. Yeah. I was very surprised by this. I thought we were just going to cruise into a very chill ending to the episode. <laughs> yeah. It really felt like that. And uh, they they get on the FaceTime with the ambassador. And again, they're like, dude, what the hell? And he's like, well, I just shot your transporter. Like, I didn't shoot anything important. I just don't want you to take the thing that's keeping the barrier down. Janeway's like, when you shoot and I'm not expecting it. It's actually very bad for me. <laughs> You're supposed to give me some kind of warning before you shoot. That way I can prepare. <laughs> Finally, this episode pays off its deep sea storyline. Tom Paris gets a call while he's doing his driver's test. This is the stand up and cheer moment of the episode. So great. So fun. He stops trying to pretend to be a responsible driver in front of this fucking guy. He starts like doing loop the loops. He starts dog fighting with this other ship. He beams up the entire expedition that the Ladosian sent and locks them in the back of the flyer. Shimoda style. How did you do that? <laughs> then like phasers the nose cone and escapes out from under the dome, like just in time, just as it's closing up. So exciting. It's so great. Such a great sequence. So many ideas that like wouldn't have made any sense without the whole episode to explain what was going on that just like go by in the blink of an eye because this scene is so action packed. It's neat to see the Delta Flyer's capabilities like as a strafing vehicle. Yeah. It's pretty solid. It's good stuff. Uh, and uh, that's it. Our button on the episode is a little convo between Seven and Chakotay in the cargo bay. A little bit awkward. Kind of had a like morning after a one night stand. Yeah. This to it. I'm only going to tell you this just once. It never happened. 
They're like, you know, oh, no, you go first. No, you go first. And Stefan is trying to pawn off her blanket on Chakotay. And he's like, I actually do have like kind of a lot of burlap in my collection already. So maybe better if you keep this. And she's like, yeah, but like just the like Eminem vibe is not really my thing. Like <laughs> doesn't really go with my decor of pelican cases. What am I supposed to do? Like drape this behind my chair like a like a Mintakan scroll or whatever. Yeah. Like that's not gonna look right. At least that was like tasteful and subtle, right? Like this is a blanket with M&M's stone onto it. But in a way you could make the case that like so many beads on the driver's seat of a of a cab, like those M&M's might come in handy if if you get a long sit session, right? <laughs> yeah. Throw it in your emergency uh Kit, and you know, that won't be empty next time we get into a scrape. <laughs> he apologizes for blowing the conference plan for her, and she doesn't care about that. She's concerned about the Ladosians, and she knows that they were able to scan the tech that they left on the surface before Paris destroyed it. And chances are they're going to be back inside that barrier after Voyager leaves. And on that note, we get pan flute to credits, Ben. Did you like this episode? You know, I'm really easy to get along with most of the time. But I don't like bullying, I don't like Fred, and I don't like you. I did like this episode. I think uh, we made we made some fun of it at the beginning, but I think that uh, overall, structurally and, and performance-wise, this was a really terrific episode of Star Trek. Especially like Robert Beltran, Jerry Ryan, and, and B Dunks are just like so great in this one. And I loved how much it gave them to do, you know, like they they all had like interesting and really different roles and were doing doing stuff that they don't normally get to. Um and you know, like I felt like Chicote being around a, a bunch of like hunter gatherer tribal style people is something that Voyager has done in a way that felt a little gross and icky in the past. And in this episode, I was like, this, this is just like, this is just d different kind of people. And they're not, it, it didn't, it didn't have the like pan flute gross outs that early season episodes did for me. But God, didn't this episode tease that though? Like the, the pan flute on pan flute action that you get this episode between Chakotay and the past people, like you just almost assume it's going to be bad. It is a tension that runs through it. And I thought it was amazing that they never really got gross. Yeah, I thought the same thing. I, I also think that, look, the, the, the worst part of a child actor's performance is often their delivery of dialogue. Autumn Reeser is great in this episode because she doesn't say shit, <laughs> along with <laughs> along with the rest of her people. Like that's some great child acting there. All of the all the past people, all the loincloth folks, I thought were cool and interesting. And I think it's because they had no dialogue. I think that really was a massive decision here because if you give them stilted dialogue yeah and you have yeah. and you have chakotay kind of stilt his own dialogue in order to like try to communicate i think this episode is 100 percent worse than what it is as it is like i think it's better through its restraint in those two areas specifically and I, that's why i think it's solid yeah good call I'm gonna go see if we have any completely silent priority one messages ben you want to join me mm. I think that would also be a good call. Priority one message from Starfleet coming in on secured channel. Need a supplemental income. Supplemental income? Supplemental. Supplemental. Yeah, it's extra. But the interest alone could be enough to buy this ship. Adam, our first priority one message is from Ludo Ergo Ferro. It goes like this. Is that Latin? Uh... Probably. Oh, and it's to us. And okay. it goes like this. Uh, I am once again drunk P1-ing you, having graduated from DS9 to Voyager. Voyager was my first trek, and I'm relishing this potty. So many deeply repressed memories of pan flute and Neelix cheese, 
Shout out to Mike H. If you have listened this far after I introduced you to Greatest Gen, tell Val I'm sorry. As many concurrent Mayquees drops as you are willing to put. About that. Wow. Well, thank you for uh, getting drunk and uh, using using your state of inebriation to our benefit, Ludo Ergo Pharaoh. And thanks for putting a friend onto the show as well. Yeah, that's that's one of the best things you can do. It's a real friend I of DeSoto the, right there. I love the idea of like my first trek is something that I am like embarrassed about and it's Voyager. <laughs> Imagine like my that. first trek is TNG and it's something I have like some weird embarrassing feelings about. And I love that it can be it can be any trek, you know? What's the least embarrassing first trek do you think? Oh boy. It's funny. What? I think it's probably TOS. Like yeah. I think it's circumnavigated embarrassment back into like no one's going to be mm-hmm. embarrassed about that. That's just what it is. This is like embarrassment horseshoe theory. Exactly. Wow. Ben, our second priority one message is from 2022 Julie, and it's to 2024 Julie. Okay. Their message goes like this. I recently went to a double dumbass tour in Brooklyn and still riding dat high. Here's hoping B and A are bringing it back to BK in the future with Star Trek VI. If they do, wow. I promise not to throw any Sabo unless, of course, I decide to get more hammered and make that everyone else's problem. After all, by the time I hear this, I will have just turned 30. Happy birthday to me. Wow, happy birthday, Julie. Did Julie really write this P1 message in 2022? I think so, yeah. The the requested release is two years from now. Mid That's- to late... April 2024. Some real pre-planning. That's some real good schedule work, Julie. Uh, We should probably hire you to do our schedule work. (laughs) Uh, I hope there's a way for us to get back to Brooklyn this year um, so that you can celebrate your Dirty 30 in style. Uh, What a nice message to receive. I I haven't thought about the Double Dumbass Tour in a long time. That was a great one. Yeah. Uh, Not doing Star Trek 6 this year, though. Obviously. No, not going to be this year. Get that out of your head. Um, uh, but we are doing lots of P1s this year, and if you'd like to secure yours now, whether it's for uh, ASAP or two years from now, you can uh, do that by going to MaximumFun.org slash Jumbotron. Hey, Adam. What's that, Ben? Did you find yourself a drunk Shimoda? Incredible. Drunk Shimoda! It's hard not to pick Chakotay just because... Like, he's unflappable in this episode, isn't he? Like, he's always positive. He's always down to take the scenic route. He's always down to believe the best of these loincloth folks. Mm -hmm. He's always looking out for them. There's a shot where he's talking to that guy and making his his map in the dirt, and the guy's loincloth is just, like, wrapped right around his pecker. You're just like, we're looking at this man's penis. Like... (laughs) This does not count as it being covered up for TV. <laughs> it's a weird version of Nuck where it's just like drape Nuck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty intense. And I just so expected a fist fight to break out or some sexy times or whatever. Like, <laughs> good restraint by Chicote here. Yeah. He, he does not accept the gift of the consort. He manages to communicate the bare minimum to accomplish his mission. Uh, yeah. he, his leg does not need to be amputated. That could have been a fun part of the this episode, The poultice worked. Right? Like, yeah. like, imagine if they got to remove the leg below the knee. Like, that's some tension. But no, we got we to gotta cut over to Paris in the Delta Flyer. <laughs> that's what we need to spend our time doing. Maybe that storyline is the Shimoda of this episode. <laughs> Man, yeah, I was I was getting ready to join you on the Chicote Square, and I was going to specifically cite grabbing the empty bag on mm-hmm. the way out of the burning building. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, Ch- I think Tom Paris's uh, traffic school storyline has got to be the drunk Shimoda. One of the ways that 
Chakotay and Seven's relationship are wildly different from the relationship I have with my wife and maybe yours is that if I were fleeing my burning home with a bag that ended up being empty, I would be in big trouble. <laughs> I would be in awful, awful trouble. <laughs> The 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 fire that burned down my house would be secondary to, <laughs> would be the, to how thing scorching that she was my wife's less eyes mad about. <laughs> <laughs> Your emergency supply case was empty. <laughs> what the hell am I supposed to do with an empty case? You can sleep in the street. <laughs> okay, in the hotel. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. <laughs> Seven's very forgiving by comparison. I'm gonna head over to the game of buttholes. The will of the caretaker, which Wendy keeps reminding us we need to think about updating in time for for uh Star Trek Enterprise. Yeah. Uh our runabout is currently on square 99, Mornhammered Square right in front of us there. I think the update should be we stop uh, we stop the game altogether. <laughs> what do you think about that? I like there being like a, an element of, uh, of uncertainty at the end of these episodes. All right. Okay. I mean, like, I'm, I'm all for ending the game, but if we can come up with something that, that replaces that. You know, like the game replaced... Vito's and mm. maybe we should bring Vito's back <laughs> for, for a show neither of us really know enough about to <laughs> responsibly use them we should instead of Vito's uh, be able to play rewatching an episode of TNG <laughs> for the show <laughs> at, at opportune moments our next episode is season 7 episode 23 homestead neelix is faced with the decision of a lifetime when voyager locates a tribe of exiled talaxians on a distant asteroid another tribe episode adam we should do the game for enterprise but here's what should happen here's a combination of game and veto <laughs> okay should either of us land on a square that the other person does not want to participate in the the person who is against the square has a a quantum leap card that they can play where wow. instead of the episode we just do an episode of quantum leap <laughs> <laughs> and then and then we we do the episode as scheduled but absent whatever weird gamification that was supposed to occur holy shit yeah the bacula modifier that's what Amazing. i'm saying <laughs> the the uh, the Beto, if you will. <laughs> okay. uh, that's a pretty solid pitch. Um, we'll keep considering what to do. Let's keep workshopping this at the end of our uh, our episodes here, toward the end of Voyager. I like it. I like it. You're required to learn as you play. Roll. I'm gonna go ahead and roll the bone and see what happens next week. Big roll, Adam. I've rolled a five, jumping us past that Morn Hammered Square. Chula! Did I win? Hardly. On to square four for a regular episode next week. Which means it's still possible to hit that Morn Hammered Square if we hit the Caretaker Square. You're right. At some point yeah. in the coming weeks. Could happen. It could happen. All right, Adam. This has been a whole lot of fun, but we got to go. We got to get the hell out of here. Yeah. If you enjoy our program, uh, please leave a nice review on your favorite podcast app. Uh, Apple Podcast probably the most helpful, but I think uh, if your if your podcatcher has a review function, we wouldn't kick a, a nice review out of bed. If you have a bad review to leave, maybe uh, don't. Greatest Gen still the most and best reviewed Star Trek podcast out there. Let's keep it that way. Yeah, that would be cool. Stay out ahead. We got to thank our producer, Wendy Pretty, who uh, edits all these episodes. Got to thank Rob Adler, who uh, runs our social medias, and Bill Tilly, the card daddy, our consigliere, who, uh, without whom 
none of this would really be possible. Uh, we got to thank Adam Ragusea, who is hard at work on the music for the next edition of this show as we transition over to Enterprise. And we got to thank uh, Dark Materia for letting us use the Picard song originally. Follow us on socials at Greatest Trek on pretty much every platform worth using. Uh, get subscribed to our YouTube channel and our mailing list. We're going to start doing like a like a monthly email newsletter uh, to let people know like what's going on behind the scenes and stuff. So if you enjoy what we do and uh, want to want to receive uh, the occasional newsletter from us, uh, you know we're going to have fun stuff in there. Yeah, uh, from I what I pitching. understand, you and I are going to be uh, writing stuff in there. It's going to be yeah. a unique thing. Yeah, so uh, you can sign up for that, I think, at podshop.biz or at gach.biz slash mail, uh, whichever one is easier for you to find. And uh, I'm sure there's a link to uh, to a sign-up form in the show notes, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, buy something at podshop.biz. That's a fun way to support the show. And uh, with that, we will be back at you next week. Another great episode of Star Trek Voyager. And an episode of The Greatest Generation Voyager that does kind of a lot of foot stuff. Looking forward to that. Gross. Make it show. Maximum Fun. A worker-owned network of artist-owned shows supported directly by you.